Hi, prospective VIP kid teachers. Teacher Angela here. I wanted to share a very useful tool that is available to all VIP kid teachers to give to their recruits, and that is the VIP kid teacher applicant performance indicator document. This is basically the scoring sheet that they use, all of the different criteria that they're scoring you on throughout the process. There are 24 different ones and I wanted to go through them in a video to show you exactly how to nail each one. I can also email this document to you if you want to study it yourself or your referral teacher can. If you don't have a referral teacher, send me an email below. I would ha be happy to coach you through, be a referral teacher, send this to you, give you any other tips, answer any other questions you have. So let's jump in. The first eight criteria has to do with your ESL foundation. Now, before I go any further, I didn't have an ESL foundation. However, I practiced these and I applied them and I got hired. So if these are new to you, then you have some homework to do, but it doesn't mean you won't get hired if you don't have an ESL background. The first one is TPR and demonstration. TPR stands for total physical response. Think about it this way. How many songs do you have memorized? Like thousands? You see memes all over the internet that it's like, how do I have 12,000 songs memorized but I can't remember the details for this test, right? It's because that information is stored in a different part of our brain. This is the concept of TPR. If you're attaching a movement to a word or a phrase, they're more likely to learn it and comprehend it and remember it. So when we attach movement to fox or speak, we want them to speak, I'm listening, right? If we attach relevant motions, more or less, to what we're teaching them, and we get them to repeat it with the motion, they're more likely to remember it. So it's really important that you model drawing a line, circling, right? Does that make sense? So as often as you can, you need to find a way to incorporate TPR and to demonstrate, okay? So the second one, appropriate output, how fast are you speaking? How many incidental words are you sneaking in there? How difficult are the words that you're using? How long of sentences are you using? I always tell my applicants who are in the interview stage or doing a beginner lesson that their sentences should be like three or four, even the reward system. When I, I Skype with them and they say, good job, you earned a tooth. I say, no, good job, tooth, that's it. Anything, this is a, you earned a. Imagine if you were learning Chinese and you know good job and you know tooth, but you hear good job, this is a. You hear all these extra words that you're not familiar with. This is gonna lower the quality of the lesson for sure. Any, any confusion you let in is going to lower the quality. So keep your sentences short. The third area is attitude. Are you enthusiastic and positive and fun? Do you keep them engaged? Do you keep their eyes on you? Or are they bored? Are they looking around? Right? So you need to encourage the student and keep their attention. And you do this by having a good, upbeat, positive attitude. Area four is supplementary tools. So this is your props, your whiteboard, your letters, your reward system, a puppet, things that I've all talked about in other videos that are very important. Be creative. We want the students who are in their own house, surrounded by their own toys, to want to keep their eyes on you. So you need to be engaging and creative and find ways to make it entertaining, more or less. The fifth area is the mastery of English. If you are telling the student to say, puh, puh, that's not right. We don't say, stop puh, stop puh. No, so you need to do your homework on this one. You need to understand synthetic phonics and how to make the right sound for the letters. You need to know your grammar, your syntax, your diction. You need to get a brief a review on these if you don't remember them. The good thing about VIP Kid, not to scare you if English wasn't your, your major, it was not mine, is you can review lessons before you teach them. When a student books you, you can go review the materials and if you're teaching them about present continuous tense, you can go do a quick review of that concept so that you're um, ready to teach it. Area six, and this is where a lot of people get tripped up, is positive correction. Remember, if these kids spoke perfect English, they wouldn't need us. So your interviewer, your mock class mentor, they are going to make mistakes on purpose to see how well you respond. A lot of applicants 
have a script and they're ready and they know what they're going to say and they know what the student is going to say, the interviewer just sits there. Or they say, panda, instead of panda. And then the teacher just thinks and goes on. And they think, I didn't hear them right. When you hear a mistake, fix it. Fix everything. They want to learn to speak English fluently. So if you, base, if you say, if you hold up this and say panda, and they say panda, you say panda, ah, ah, panda. The seventh area is repetition. When you are teaching a new concept, a new word, a new sound, you need to get them to repeat it three times. Fox. Fox. Shh. Fox. Good job. Okay. And area eight is full sentences. Another way they're going to look for you to correct is to get them to speak in complete sentences. So this is another problem a lot of applicants don't realize that if they're getting the correct responses but they're not in complete sentences they could still get marked down for this even in the beginning if you say what is your name and they say Jerry you need to say my name is Jerry good job so complete sentences for everything this is a panda okay the next Six have to do with VIP kid techniques. So the first section is classroom management. This has to do with your reward system and also discipline. There will be students who are hyper and distracted. A lot of the times they have their parents sitting with them. But you need to do your best to keep them engaged whether a parent is there or not. A secondary reward system is really important for this. It serves as kind of a break when they're you know, repeating and reading over and over and all of a sudden you say, oh, Jerry, let's pick a shirt. And you hold up some options. Their brain is taking a break. This is funny. They like this. So you need to manage your classroom well and keep them engaged and keep them motivated through reward systems. The second area under VIP Kid Techniques is lesson planning. How well do you know the material you're teaching? How well are you able to present it? Are you using engaging and fun and educational activities? Are you having to stop to read what you're supposed to do? Are you having to stop to see what's next? There should be a flow and that will show if how well you've prepared your lesson. The third is pacing and timing. Everybody's worst enemy, right? This is so much easier when you're an actual teacher, I'll tell you that, because you have a classroom timer and you can see minute one, minute two, it's just constantly counting and you can match it up with the clock on your computer and the slide you're on. So if it says six minutes, you should be on slide six. This is not as easy as you're preparing for the interview in the mock, but what I tell my applicants is to practice one slide at a time with a timer set at one minute and do just that slide over and over again until you have it under a minute, including time to allow them to respond. Do this over and over because likely they'll make a mistake and you'll need a little bit of extra time. So practice one minute at a time and then set a timer and do the whole thing because timing is really important. The fourth area is rapport. Are you making friends with this student? You might see them again. It's important to be excited. Hi, what is your name? If they're older, asking questions. I always ask, what did you do today? Sometimes they don't understand. So I'll think of something they do know. I'll say, did you go to school? They always, always know that one. <gasps> yes, or sometimes no. If they're younger, I'll say, I'll ask their favorite color. What is your favorite color? And I have some blocks I'll hold up. Color. You can hold up a rainbow. Anyway, get to know them. Have fun with them. Build that relationship of trust and end the same way. Time to say goodbye. See you next time. Goodbye, Jerry. Okay, fifth is energy level. You sit 
in your exact same position? Is your posture kind of bad? Are you flipping through? How's your voice? Are you kind of monotone? Are you excited? And your eyebrows go up and down and your voice goes loud to soft and back. This matters. If your kid or if you were learning another language through the computer, but you were in your own home, what's going to keep you interested? Excitement, energy, creativity. So this is important. That energy level needs to be up there. And the sixth important VIP kid technique is sticking to the lesson objectives. This is so important. Here's a tip for anyone getting ready for their interview or a beginner mock. So the first part of mock one, possibly your mock two. Stick almost word for word to the objectives in everything you say. What do you see? My ear is not up here. Right? Circle the, this is pretty much your script. Your script should pretty much come from the lesson objectives. It is laid out for you. So, love, worship that document that they give you. Okay? So, those are the six VIP kid techniques. They're going to grade you whether you always fulfill the requirements, sometimes fulfill the requirements, or rarely fulfill those requirements. So, fulfill every single one. The next area of performance indicators are your teaching practices. So the area one is talk time. This has to do with the student output, the difficulty of the words they speak, their sentence length, the speaking speed, um, and the 50-50 rule for lower and the 30-70 for higher. So how, how do you do this? Basically if it's a lower level, everything that you say for the most part they should be repeating or it should be a question they're answering. For an older student, you should be asking open-ended questions so that their answer is longer than your question. Does that make sense? That makes sense, right? Check out my other videos and I go through and give some examples of how to ask these questions, what kind of answers to um, expect. Area two for the teaching practices is adapting to the student. Watch your student. Are they bored? Are they distracted? Do they look confused? Can they hear you? Can you hear them? I have some students that scribble and scribble and scribble on the slides. Oh, and I have to constantly clear it. So you know what I do for them for their reward system? I take a note of that and then I say, no, no, stop, stop. Do you want to draw? And I have how to draw rewards and I'll say, we will draw a dog. You do a good job. Good job? Draw a dog, okay? And that's their reward. Their reward is I let them draw. So you need to adapt to your students. Find out what they like. Consider their reaction to how you're teaching. Area three is patience. I am not good at this one. Still, how long do you wait for them to answer? Do you give them enough time to respond? I find myself asking a question and not waiting very long. And then I'll jump in and say it for them. And I'm still working on this. So keep that in mind. They need to think this through. And this is their second language. So they need to really think it through. They need some time. So be patient. Give them confidence. You know they can answer this question. If they can't, give them some hints before you just shout it out to them, okay? Don't rush them. Don't interrupt them, okay? Area four is transcending. Do you extend the material to help explain it? Do you give outside examples? Do you know the previous knowledge? from the objectives that could help build on the new concepts. So you want to adapt and transcend the material to further their understanding. Area five is extending. So this is when you have extra time usually. You will go kind of above and beyond um, the lesson. I do this by at reading books with them. So I have simple books and I will hold it up to the screen and have them read like this. I let them do the reading. That's important. I don't read to them. I already know how to speak English. I already know how to read. They don't. So let them do it. You'll hear conflicting things on this. A lot of people say, don't read books. You can read books and it's great. They need to learn how to read, but they need to be the ones doing the reading. And that's a great way to extend, especially if, and it should, um, relate to the lesson. So I have, for my colors lessons, I have brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? 
This is actually in Portuguese and English because my husband's from Brazil, so we're teaching our kids Portuguese. But I just, I just hide the Portuguese part so I don't um, confuse them. Okay, so those are the five indicators for teaching practices. The last section is professionalism. The first is presentable. Are you presentable? Are you wearing a plain t-shirt? No letters, no logos, no patterns. You don't want anything to distract them. You need to be neat and clean. Your hair needs to be just, it can be simple, it can be clean. Just not messy, right? Makeup is not necessary. You're going to hear a lot of people say that it is, and it's not. I love makeup. Makeup is like my artistic outlet. And I usually have makeup on on days I don't have anywhere to go because I actually have time to do it. That's usually when I make my YouTube videos too on my days off. But I rarely wear makeup when I teach because it's early in the morning and it's not necessary. It's not. Good teachers do not necessarily wear makeup. So keep that in mind. The one caveat to that, I think lipstick helps draw the eye to the mouth, which is important. Because when you're talking, that's where you want their eyes to go. You want them to see how to form the words. Sometimes I'll throw on some bright red lipstick that I would normally never wear. But it's not necessary. It's not. Don't feel like this job depends on appearance because it does not. Area two is technology. Your headphones working? I don't think mine are right now. But is your camera working? Is it clear? Are you speaking clear? Is your internet connect connection fast? Do a ping test on your internet. So the way you do this is just Google it, and the ping is basically how long it takes your internet to send a message and then come back. You want this to be really, really low. Is your audio high quality? A good way to test your technology is to have a Skype call with someone first and ask them how well they can see you, how well they can hear you, if there's any lag. Make sure your mouse, there's no lag in your mouse drawing, or if you have a touch screen, if there, make sure there's no lag. Area three is your background. When I teach, um, the the area that they can see is smaller than this. They can't see my printer. They can't see this. They only see this. Sometimes my diplomas they can see. But it's simple. It's educational. You can make your own educational background. Just get a plain white poster board and write the alphabet very clean, very neat. It needs to be tidy and not distracting. But it needs to be like a classroom, not cluttered. You don't want too much going on because that's distracting. But you can have your reward system. A lot of people use magnetic boards, like an oil drip pan from Walmart. Those are magnetic and you can hang them up with like command strips so you don't have to damage your wall. And some people just buy little magnets so they can stick on everything and that's how they keep organized. So you need to have a good background. Four is distance. You want to be far away enough from the camera that they can see your hands and they can see your movements, but not too far away that they can't see your mouth or, you know, it's awkward. You don't want to be too close because, again, it's mostly about your hands. I think this is the important thing. And a lot of people I Skype with, they're way too close and they're doing things with their hands. And I can't see what they're doing. So you need to be an appropriate distance from the camera. The angle needs to be right on. You don't need to be looking up your nose or, you know, down at your nose. The, the fifth thing is lighting. So many people get docked on this. You need to make sure the light is coming at you. If it's behind you, you're going to see shadows on your face. You want to be prominent in the camera. So make sure the lighting is right on you. I have this, I'm just gonna mess up my lighting because I'm using it right now. This lamp that I got from TJ Maxx, and it's kind of like a spotlight. Do you see this? Let me turn this off. This is what I'm using right now. It's what I use when I teach. And I feel like it really puts the um, focus on my face. So lighting is important. Um, you want to be able to see yourself in your background, your teaching tools clearly. There should be no shadows on you throughout the whole time. Okay, so that's it. This is these are the performance applicators. There are 24 of them. They're very important. You want to get top marks in all of them. If you want this document, send me an email and I will email it to you and I will help you with whatever step of the process you are on. The IP kit is the greatest job ever. And I am so dedicated to helping anyone else get this job because it is a lifesaver. The flexibility, the pay, and the reward that you get from teaching your students is remarkable. So drop me a comment, send me an email, and let's get you hired, okay? Good luck, happy teaching.